I have with me right now uh, Dimitri Samakis. Uh, Dimitri is a uh, really multimedia producer in different facets, um, but most recently he's focused on video production. Uh, he's been working as an independent blogger uh, at the blog Everything is Terrible. Uh, he also works in Los Angeles with the uh, independent Cine Family Nonprofit Theater uh, and uh, recently worked as a producer at the cable channel Current TV on the program Infomania. Um, Dimitri, first, thanks for spending some time with us. Um, I was wondering if you could first, just so my students uh, can get familiar, for those who aren't, describe sure. um, Everything is Terrible, Cine Family, and uh, Infomania. Sure. Uh, well, uh, Everything is Terrible is basically the blog that I co-created or I don't even really think of it as a blog, more as a uh, just kind of a found footage collective. Okay. But it happens to be on a really crappy blog <laughs> um, where we just post daily content of old uh, like VHS tapes and old forgotten media and we try to remix it in ways that are interesting to us and try to make it goofy or funny or poignant or stupid and it's just a nonstop machine. And we also make uh, basically we take the we take the footage from that past year or two years, uh, and then make try to make a narrative out of it. So we try to make a movie out of thousands of other movies. Uh, and then we got what did you say, Cine Family? Yeah, Cine <laughs> Family. To... Your many your many so... media mm -hmm. hats here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, then the, the work that I do at Cine Family is they're a nonprofit repertory theater, so we play anything from. Godard to, you know, uh, punk films to silent stuff to uh, just, you know, VHS garbage, stuff that I like. Uh, it's kind of all over the place. So what I do is I'm a programmer there and I'm also in charge of trailers, posters, just kind of getting the message out, advertising. And we are most currently doing uh, our third annual Everything is Festival, which is like a kind of a, I can get into that later, but that's sort of like a collaborative thing and uh that's killing me right now and uh and then my work at current tv was basically i was a producer editor so the work that i'd done and everything is terrible and the little bit of work that i did at cinefam at the time really helped so uh really helped give me the job which then was basically a very similar thing we would the show was created by uh, a woman who created the daily show co-created the daily show oh wow so yeah it was a show that it was definitely underappreciated, and nobody knew it was a show. <laughs> but um, what was kind of nice about it, it was sort of a mix to me of like The Daily Show, The Soup, and then just kind of like general like web video stuff. Uh, 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 there was some great comedians on there where they all had their take on certain things. We had a you know female correspondent, a gay correspondent, a curmudgeon correspondent, like a music guy, and they'd all get together. We'd all find media from all over the internet, from all over news. We had constant, we were taping stuff all the time. And then basically our job was to edit that down and say, how can we give you the week of media in 20 minutes, in 25 minutes? And that was... So it was a weekly program. I'm sorry? It was a weekly program. So weekly program, yes. We tried to basically water down the information for you and cram it in to one half hour program of just anything. From, and make it interesting. Know, make it interesting, exactly. Cool, great. Um, so I think that kind of leads into my next question, which is now that we have an idea of, you know, the types of places uh, you do your work, sure. um, could you describe what you do as a video producer, editor, uh, a blogger, or social media, internet video person and, and filmmaker? I mean, those are different hats you wear. Um, sure. what goes into those different, uh, jobs? I guess what goes into it is honestly, it, for me at least, it's all sort of a, a, a mix of curation and then what are you going to do with that and then creating something out of that. Whether that means literally, like with everything is terrible, we literally do that. We take footage and we say, okay, we're going to take someone's you know, creative uh, creativity. Wherever it, wherever it stopped, we're going to keep it going and we're going to let it live on and try to make something new out of it. Um, or when it comes to just like a lot of the work I do with cine is just trailer editing where it's just communicating a message of just like, here's this awesome movie. It's great. How can I communicate it in like a minute or less how great it is? Cause I doubt anyone's ever heard of it. <laughs> so how can we make this, how can we communicate this message? 
So for me, yeah, it's a lot of just curation, communication, and then, you know, getting it out there. <laughs> and so, but it's very, I think a lot of it is very similar, whether that's producing, whether that's editing, whether that's blogging, whatever it is, it's all kind of the same thing. What would you say, uh, you know, consistently throughout the different uh, hats as an editor, you know, <laughs> touring with your films, um, what are the skills that you've found consistently throughout your career in video uh, that you've used or that uh, my students would want to have? You know, sure, to... sure, sure. I guess a lot of it was really, uh, at least like when I was in school, I was never really happy with just like one major because I couldn't really, I, a lot of it was just that I couldn't focus. And it also was like, no, all this stuff is interesting. Like at first I wanted to do audio. Then I went into try to do design. Then I was trying to do illustration. But th there was just like not a lot of room or not a lot of, professors for what I wanted to do and really what I turned out to be is okay it's just gonna have to be a mix of everything I'm just gonna have to get into whatever classes I can uh, and just sort of combine it all and take you know I, a lot of it is also just even that is sort of a form of curation really where I was taking stuff that I really liked in audio production then going into design classes I realized you know it's all pretty similar it's the same principles and if I apply those principles into whatever it is, into Adobe Illustrator, what you know, it's all kind of what I'm. I'm going to like what I make, basically. Mm -hmm. So I think with a lot of that stuff was learning the program does take a little while, but that's not really the hard part. I think really is kind of figuring out what you like and how you're going to communicate that message, no matter what the program is. What's your favorite part? What's your in in the whole process of uh, video communication? Um, and on the different platforms, if you had to pick one specific job in that whole process, what what do you I think, love? I think maybe the easy. I think maybe for me, at least, what I do also for a living, which is like a lot of my at least freelance work, is illustration. I think honestly, like as much as it, as much as I'm doing the 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 animation and the After Effects stuff and the editing, it's really I think there's something very wonderful about being in a room alone and just drawing <laughs> and uh, again it's still sort of the same uh, idea of like of editing where it all basically comes down to a composition and I just love kind of taking something from nothing and creating creating something I don't know that cool. to me that's my favorite part so, of it. but so I, uh, you know editing is a close second there's something wonderful about editing as well <laughs> great um I was going to ask this a little later, but I, I might as well ask it now. It's a good transition. So, you know, looking through your uh, uh, your work, you know, you've worked freelance in graphic design uh, as well as your video production work for yeah. a number of great, you know, companies, Cartoon Network, Nickelodeon, The New York Times, the list goes on. Um, what would you say uh, the biggest difference between working in graphic design and working in, in video is... And and how is it different to come up with stories um, in in a graphic versus in 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 video? Uh, I guess to answer the, the the last part of your question first, it's like I think for for me the har the hardest part with video, the biggest challenge is just the fact that you are working with uh, a number of people. Not that working with people is a bad thing; it's just that you're dealing with schedules and other people's visions and blah blah blah. And it's that's not necessarily a problem. I just mean when it comes to something like illustration, it's just you, maybe an art director, but that's not until after, whereas video can be very fun, but it's also very frustrating that you have to deal with actors, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But uh, so for me, that's kind of why uh, that's sort of like the next step of stuff I'm trying to get into, more video stuff, because I kind of feel bad that I've sort of left that alone for so long. But um, uh, but really the biggest difference is I think uh, – as far as what were you saying? What was your question? As far yeah, so, as uh, so, so how how does um, you know, how do you come up with stories? So, so what you just answered, I think, covers pretty well how they differ, and that's very similar to um, an answer that uh, when I did an interview with an audio producer, you know, I, I asked what's the difference between working in a studio and working on your own thing, and he said, working in a studio is so much about managing people, and it sounds like, you know, yeah. maybe between between video and, and graphic work that working with people element is, is way different. But how, how do you um, come up with the stories differently 
even in your sort of um, more yeah. personal work, like everything is terrible, where maybe you're not working with a yeah. collective of people. But when you sit down to draw versus when you sit down with all this footage, how is that yeah. storytelling process different for you? I guess it's really not that different to me. I guess the thing of it is, I just like, I think at this point, you know, I'm 30 now. So I think I'm just kind of like, I know what I think is funny. I know what I think is interesting. And I'm, I've also just been really focused on if I like something, I'm going to venture in it and just keep digging until I get sick of it. So I think with, with illustration, for example, it's like, oh, if it's a poster or a uh, just something personal, to me it's sort of like, okay, how can I sort of tell a story just with one image? It's probably going to be a little depressing. It's probably going to be a little creepy, whatever. But I don't even really think of it. Like, I don't really go, oh, I have like a, like a goal here. It's just like, I'm just going to kind of let go, not really think about it. And then it's pretty similar with, 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 let's say for found footage for editing. So with everything is terrible, we have for the last movie we did, I mean, we had more footage than ever and we hadn't seen any of it. We had to watch it first as opposed to taking stuff from the blog. Uh, and it was all dog movies, which was a, some of the worst stuff ever made. So it was a very, very similar thing where it's like, okay, what am I going to do with all this? What story am I going to tell? Let me just sort of let go, watch it all, then see what happens. And just see whatever I pick up on and then just dive in. So if I think something's funny, I'm just going to be become obsessed with it until it's not funny anymore. <laughs> and it's pretty much the same thing with illustration or design or whatever. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, so uh, thinking about uh, everything is terrible, um, how did you get started working with that? What's what's sort of the story of the history uh, of getting that going? So with that, that was me and my buddy uh, Nick Meyer, who went to OU, and all my other buddies who went to OU. We were we were in Chicago collecting this stuff, and even in college, we were collecting and watching this stuff. And we kept thinking, like, man, we got to do some of our own. This is so cool. Uh, we you know, there was stuff out there that we liked, like TV Carnage, EBN, Negative Land. And we really like focused on that a lot. Where it was like, no, there's something about this, but we didn't care at the time. We just kind of put it off. And then when I moved out to LA in 2007, I kind of felt bad that Nick and I especially hadn't been working together on video the whole time. We kept talking about it, doing comedy stuff, maybe doing whatever, but we didn't really like sketch. Con you know, we were kind of sick of like that world of sketch, which we used to do. And then we said, well, why don't we just start communicating with each other, me and you and a couple other people, whoever wants to do it, we'll just start sending stuff back and forth, put it on YouTube, put it on a blog, I guess, whatever. And the goal, I think, was just to have one DVD where we could say, oh, if you don't know me, here's this DVD, here's what I do, this is what I like, the end, whatever. Mm -hmm. And then uh, about six months in or whatever, I don't really know how much long after, it started to kind of pick up attention like on Boing Boing and BuzzFeed and Video Gum, and we realized like, oh my God, this isn't an everyday, th this has to be an everyday thing. This isn't like a hobby anymore, this is sort of our job now. So with us and... Uh, uh, Katie, Nick, all these other guys from from OU, uh, we all just kind of kept going, and then it just it's like a machine now that just can't be stopped. That's really the only way to describe it. It's something completely out of our hands now at this point. <laughs> How did you guys, as sort of a group of friends, um, doing a couple blogs? You know, t t after there was the success, and you were like, we need to start. Um, getting this as a day-to-day -day thing and getting, you know, this is going to be our, our jobs or it might be. Uh, how did how did it evolve? How did the, the your group evolve in your process uh, and sort of, you know, your structure? I think I think that's something actually we're honestly still trying to kind of figure out where uh, it's, the hardest part about it is doing everything from across the country. So I think like five of the guys are in Chicago. Two of them are moving out to L.A., but for the last four years they've been there. Uh, you know, Joel's been in New York. Uh, I've been in LA. It's been it's been frustrating. So I think that that is the biggest thing is how to communicate with each other from thousands of miles away. Uh, when it comes, especially when it comes to the movies, when it comes to the daily postings, it's all just kind of on its own now. We mm -hmm. sort of decided, okay, why don't we all pick a day once a week where you just make whatever? Like we're not going to tell you what to do or anything like that. It's just going to be just that's how we'll fill the content every day. We just at least have to have one video. We would like to have more, but honestly, I think that would kind of be overkill even and just too much work. Um, but we've, got, we've been getting a lot more help. There have been a few people who've been, uh, came out of like the woodwork and just guys who are comedians, or whatever, that have said like, hey, I'd like to edit a few videos. And some of them do it all the time. Some have been doing it every couple of weeks, which is amazing. So it's sort of still evolving. We're, 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 right now, I'm kind of treating it like an umbrella 
for everything else that we're kind of doing in that world. So it's like, I love the fact that I get to do posters for it and sell, you know, screen prints and sell them at shows. And mm-hmm. uh, other guys get to, you know, we get to kind of build the, 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 the live show together. That's a whole nother thing when we all get together. So for the tour, so there's just all these different elements that involve puppet making, that involve, uh, you know, dance numbers, that involve, uh, uh, of course, just like the practical stuff, like building a DVD, all that stuff we just have to learn. And it's, we're still learning, definitely. Uh, and it's it's really frustrating. But it's awesome, you know. So is it kind of, um, do you guys work as a collective and sort of ad hoc choose jobs to do? Sort of. I mean, I think a lot of it is like just what we're good at. We kind of decided to do like Nick, for example, who lives in Chicago. He became really good at, I mean, just for example, uh, tour management. All of a sudden he realized like he was, (laughs) we all realized he was amazing at it where he booked a 70 day tour last year uh, in 2010, which was insane. Like that was crazy. He did it without any knowledge of the business. Nothing. I mean, you know, for better or worse, that's insane to us. Like, you know, most people hire somebody to do that. We decided, nah, dumb. Let's just call these guys ourselves. Just call theaters we like, venues, bars, whatever, uh, practice spaces. Uh, and then when we did it the second time, it was definitely easier. But still, he was so good at that part of it that it was like, we didn't have to touch it. That was Nick's thing. Same with me with, like, the design and sort of look of it. It's like, don't worry about it. I got it. If anyone wants to collaborate, go ahead. But, like chances are you're going to be busy doing your thing. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so it so kind it, of or organically, the division of labor kind of just happened. Definitely. definitely. Like, especially when we're on the road, like, just like all that stuff kind of comes together where it's like, wow, it's a really good thing. Aaron, you are so good at fixing a tire. <laughs> or, I mean, it's, again, this is just an example, but it was just, it keeps coming about where I'm like, man, it's a good thing we have that guy. Mm-hmm. You know? So wow. it's, it's been great. And it's also just been a way for all of us to hang out and just, stay together after college and just keep doing something creative and feel like we're, you know, doing something. Mm -hmm. So when I think about uh, certain multimedia uh, industries like music or even mainstream film, there's sort of a process that everybody does for the touring. Um, But what you guys do is very unique uh, in that you tour with these curated DVDs and films that you make. Um, I was just wondering, how did you guys come up with sort of what you do, you know, because you guys, you can describe it a little bit, uh, you know, you've got costumes, you, you've got this whole show, um, you know, how did you come up with that, and what's it like to tour on these cross-country, multi-month trips with a film? I think with, with especially with, well, yeah, with the tour, it was when we made the first movie, we premiered it at Cinefam, that was the first place we played it, and it was a sold-out show. And we were like, what? <laughs> this doesn't make any sense. I mean, that's what we wanted. but And we had a little bit of a live show. Like, we all came out in costumes. It was sort of this cult ceremony thing. and But it was like a fun thing. Like, people came from Chicago and New York, and we just thought, let's just do this one thing. We'll worry about whatever later. Let's just do this now. This is what we, this is our goal right now, was to make this DVD. Uh, and then once we saw, I think, people get into it and watch a crowd and get, have a crowd get into it, it was like, it was like a high kind of where it was like, oh, I can make something in my bedroom like we were talking about. I can sit in my room and draw all day, but then I can make a movie or, or make this found footage thing and have hundreds of people screaming in laughter and applauding. That's insane. Like that is once you start doing that, it's like it's it really just is. A, it's like a drug. You can't you can't turn it off and you become obsessed with that chasing that high. <laughs> so I think for us, it was like immediately we were just like, oh, we have to tour. This is perfect. This is great. But we didn't do it for the first one just because, I don't know, we were just, we didn't have no idea what we were doing. But we did do a few mini tours. Like we did the Alamo Draft Houses in, uh, in Austin and surrounding Houston, all around Texas. We did, uh, I think we did a show like in Portland, whatever. We started doing it and we realized, why don't we just keep going? This is too fun and it's not making any sense for us to fly, you know, back and forth. So for the second movie, for Two Everything, Two Terrible, Two, Tokyo Drift, um, we... At the same time, while we were finishing the movie, we were planning a tour, which was totally nuts. But, you know, that was, that was again, we had at least enough of us to sort of delegate work. But it was still crazy because we were finishing the DVD based on these deadlines of, well, the DVD has to be done because the tour starts June 2nd. So yeah. <laughs> that was pretty complicated. But, again, it, sometimes deadlines really do force you to 
uh, you know, get your shit together. And that's important. So uh, as much as we kind of hated it and hated each other during that time, I mean, that was very stressful for us to like make creative decisions on the fly saying, well, the DVD has to be done in two hours, literally two hours. We need to get this done. We have to, an editing decision. It's time to, you know, let go. Mm-hmm. So there was that kind of stuff. But in the end, I'm, I'm really happy with how that one especially turned out. I think that's been my favorite one. And so we decided, it wasn't even that we decided we just couldn't help but tour. It was just like, this doesn't make any sense just to make it and then not do anything with it or to try to sell it or whatever. Because that's the thing. I think because it's such a unique thing, uh, it's, Definitely got some copyright issues, maybe. You could argue that. Uh, but no one's going to buy that from us, necessarily. Maybe they will, but that's not, that wasn't our goal, certainly. Uh, so we decided, well, the only way to really get this out there, aside from the blog, is to just literally hand it to people and give it to people. And that's just been so, so much fun. I wasn't on much of the tour last time because I was working at Infomania, mm-hmm. which was driving crazy watching how that tour evolved and what was happening. So then, uh, you know, I was on it for a couple of weeks and that was great. But this one from beginning to end was just two and a half months, 75, like 74 shows in 69 days or something like that. And it was just such a blast. Like just again, that high of. So, so do you get sick of the film? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I'll never watch it again. <laughs> really? Yes. But it, it, in a lot of ways, it's kind of awesome that I got to watch it. I mean, I avoided it anytime I could. Anytime I could leave the room, if it was like a bar or whatever, I'd go outside. But there were certain times where we'd be literally stuck behind the screen having to watch it in reverse. <laughs> you know, image. Uh-huh. you kind of learn a lot about your process when you're watching something. I mean, it's not only that I, that I watch it, you know, for probably about 50 to 100 times just during the editing process, but watching it another 75 times with totally different speaker systems, totally different, uh, you know, projectors every night, a totally different venue. Mm -hmm. And it's a really interesting way to be like, Oh wow, I got to get better at this, this, and this. Like I think for, I think for the, for, for the newest one, for doggy woggies, Kuji Uchis, we were saying my big goal was make audio, make the audio work. Cause we are taking stuff from just horrible, horrible sources. And the last one, it's definitely noticeable, uh, where it's, where it's bad, it's bad. And when you play it on a big screen, it's like, no one can hear that. We, 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 we pretended that we could, but you can't. So I spent a lot of time just dealing with audio levels and just making sure over and over and over again it sounded great. You know, got studio monitors now. That was a big difference. And again, it goes back to just trying to be good at everything. <laughs> it's just, it all comes together. Moving away from the, the touring aspect of, what does your schedule look like on a given day or week when you're not touring? Yeah, I think that's kind of that, what I like about that is that that's been very that's pretty much different every day. Where uh, I just have different clients, whether it's uh, American Greetings, I do a lot of greeting cards for them. Whether it's uh, other theaters, like there's Cinespia, which is a huge. Uh, I was just there last night. We just did that's like a a big cemetery called Hollywood Forever. They do screenings in their cemetery for about four or four or 5,000 people every week. That's crazy. So whether, the, whether it's a client of illustration, I, for them, I do trailers for Cinespia or for Cinefamily, whatever that is, it's always very different. And I think that that's always what's been really important. And I think what's so great about your class is that, uh, it kind of keeps it interesting. Like a lot of people that I know that only do video editing, I just feel like, don't you get bored? doing just one thing. There's nothing wrong with doing just one thing. I just can't stay still. So for me, it's like my, you know, Cine family might say, Oh shit, we need, we need a poster tomorrow for this movie. You've never seen. I have to figure out a way to either watch it or just take a look at it. Uh, Google image search and then just make a poster, communicate that image and just hope it works or for a trailer the same way. But it keeps it like, you know, like the, the, the principles are the same, but I like that it's a very different, uh, uh, medium all the time how does working with clients on sort of the you know making a living type stuff differ from the stuff that you do as your own creative projects um that can be a little annoying or or, or depend, you know or not i mean working with it really just depends honestly on the person i've worked with people uh, uh doing like greeting card stuff that have been wonderful 
And then I've dealt with friends of mine that I just do like a project for as a favor, and they're the biggest pain in the ass, you know, I've ever had to deal with. So th- there's, there's, but I, I, the most, for the most part, honestly, pretty, pretty good. Really, overall, there can be challenges, but um, you just kind of have to, you kind of have to, when you take on a client or when you accept their work, you just have to understand they get, they do get final say. They are your boss for the time being, and their opinion does matter for the time being. You know, they, they do have, you know, especially with stuff at the Family, I might not agree with certain things that they want me to do certain times, but we sort of compromise on something. So I'm lucky that I can, I'm lucky that I can compromise there because I'm so close with them. But there are other times where it's like very much like, nope, that's not what I want. Change it. Uh, and you just kind of have to deal with that, especially with when you're working on a TV show where it's such a fast paced environment. There's a show every week. There's not we're a very limited staff. Uh, you just kind of have to go, you know what, I'm almost just kind of just going to do whatever you want me to do. You know what I mean? Like I'm going to put in my creative work, but at, at a certain point you kind of have to just let go. And, uh, when it's a, and also when it's a paid job and it's not personal, it's kind of hard to take personally because it's a job. Sure. Yeah. So it's You're like, not as invested. Right. Which I hate to admit, but it's true. You know what I mean? If it's not something that you, what if it's something that you love to do in general, you can kind of get into it. Like when, when somebody wants a change on an illustration for a greeting card, I don't really get insulted. I'm just like, oh, that's cool. You had a different vision for this. You're still asking me to do it. You're not like, you're not firing me. You're not saying I'm going to get somebody else to do it. They're saying, nah, that's not exactly what I wanted. Try one more time. And um, again, I mean, that's where communication is important. And the more I communicate with my clients, the easier it is really. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Um, so moving into more sort of technical stuff, cause our class by, you know, and a large portion is, um, getting our ears wet with the technical tools. Yeah. Uh, what type of digital tools, uh, software and hardware, um, and, and analog, if you use that as well, uh, do you use most often? I use, okay, so my setup right over here is I have a, a Mac Tower that's all souped up. Then I've got the uh, Wacom 24HD, it's called, which is this behemoth. It is this 70 pound beast of a screen that I use as a uh, drawing tablet. So it is, it yeah, is a, a tablet. Pen. It's a tablet. Mm-hmm. So I've, I've been using Wacom stuff for a while, but this is the ultimate. This is like the Cadillac, this is the Rolls Royce of drawing tablets. It's unbelievable. I love it. Then I've got a monitor above it that's for output for video. Then as far as, uh, you know, then I got two Rocket 8s. Then as far as speak, uh, then as far as uh, programs, I've got uh, the biggest ones that I use are Final Cut, Illustrator, Photoshop, After Effects, and MPEG Stream Clip. Do you guys use MPEG Stream Clip? <laughs> it, is a, it is a conversion program that I'm using constantly. It's like a handbrake or something like that. Sure, it, uh, it, it transcodes between it, formats. It transcodes. The amount of time I use with that program is unbelievable. There's I'm, something to be said about that side of it, of the, just the boring technical stuff that you just spend your time with all day. Sure. Uh, so, I mean, so it sounds like um, you, by and large, use the Adobe Creative Suite, but you use Final Cut uh, for your video production. Um, and I've been asking many people this. Uh, with the uh, change to Final Cut Pro 10, uh, many yeah. in the industry have been unhappy with it and have uh, either stayed with Final Cut Pro 9 or migrated over to Premiere Pro. Um, I'm wondering if you are happy with 10, are you still using 9, or, and, and uh, you know, why so not Premiere Pro? Basically what they did is, so basically the, the last version of Final Cut that they came out before 10 was 7. So they literally jumped oh, from seven to ten. Okay. So what? So what that means is they jumped. Like it's almost like they said, "What are we gonna? Why don't we build an editing uh, program for the year two thousand and like sixteen? Which is like, oh, cool. Until you realize, no, it's not. It's two thousand eleven or two thousand twelve now. You know when they came out with it. So I haven't used it since it first came out. I tried it. I didn't like it, but I. Honestly, didn't give it enough of a chance. I probably spent I probably spent a couple hours on it, which is saying something considering it shouldn't take any time. You should just pick right up. Especially but, since you're a pro at Final Cut Pro. <laughs> right. It's like this shouldn't be an issue. Mm-hmm. And I'm hearing about things that they're developing to make it, uh, you know, make the user face a little bit easier. But basically what I took it is that they were trying to do is say, 
we want to make more money in the in sort of the iMovie type of world. We want to make those guys feel more professional. Let's combine the two, which is like, no, don't do that. Final Cut, first of all, Final Cut is not that complicated, really. Like, when it comes down to it, it's not something that you need to be a, an engineer to learn. Like, you know, I've looked... I've looked at professional editors' trailers, like their trailers that go out to thousands of theaters and TV shows, whatever, and you look at their Final Cut file, it's not a complicated work of art, it's just a Final Cut file. Maybe two lines of video, two lines of audio, it's stereo audio, that's really it. I mean, it, it gets complicated in the mastering and all that stuff, but really, when it comes to the video editing, yeah, that's very simple. So I don't really understand what they were doing. I'm sticking with seven. Okay, so, so Final Cut Pro is definitely like the, the industry standard. Um, yes, uh, people are moving to Avid though. That yeah. that's true. People are, mm -hmm. but now everyone's kind of in a, It's this is in a weird place right. for us. We don't know what to do. Oh, so speaking also of of digital tools, um, you know, you've certainly found a, a great deal of success uh, on the web and on social media. Uh, with everything is is terrible. Um, what type of content management software do you use on everything is terrible? Um, and also what like social media platforms, I know you guys have like jumped through YouTube and Vimeo and, and sort of what have, yeah. what are you settled on right now and, and, and how did you come to those decisions? Uh, we basically, well, that's, that's always been complicated because YouTube has this weird love hate relationship with us where they have featured us on their main page before they've interviewed us. They've, they've, they know who we are basically, or at least part of the departments do some of the departments do. And then they have a really weird policy where it's just so big. They have basically a three strikes you're out policy where anyone can copyright claim. I mean, if this if you were to put up this video on YouTube and then I will. somebody else, a third party, were to say it was their property, they don't really have lawyers that can check and see all that stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't exactly know the program or how they do it, but it's basically just automated. Where that if enough if that happens enough times, they realize okay. These guys are just going to, again, there's no decision. I think it's just automatically the account is deleted without any real uh, thought or discussion of copyright claims or whatever, fair use. YouTube works the best because if even if you have a new channel up, no other videos up, more people are going to run into your stuff. More, There's more traffic on YouTube and just crazy people searching stuff all day than you could possibly imagine. Whereas I think of Vimeo as more of like a kind of fine art Vimeo is sort of like a gallery space for me where it's like, ooh, I get to watch like a really good video, a music video in HD and it's going to be stop motion animation or something like that. So we, but as far as our stuff, we put it everywhere. We put it on UCB comedy. We put it on funny or die. We realized that we just kind of have to split it up for one reason. That's a good way to get your stuff out there and to get more people to see it who aren't just on YouTube all day. It's odd how even in the past uh, like year, really, like in the past two years especially, how much Facebook has gone from huge to bigger than huge to like just so ubiquitous. It's, it's crazy. Like it's crazy how important Facebook has been to our success or whatever you want to call it. It's been uh, from just putting – I mean I use it more than anything. Facebook is probably the most important uh, social media uh, 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 aspect of what we do more than the blog actually because our hits now go, go down uh, on our Google Analytics of our blog but our videos stay around the same sometimes they're actually way more even because people are watching them on Facebook not on your people site watching on Facebook no one's going to it's weird how there was that article in Wired last year about how the web is dead I thought that article was so interesting because at first I thought what are you talking about and it's like no it's true with things like Facebook Netflix Hulu you're using the internet, but you're not really going to websites as much. I mean, I think people like you and me probably still do constantly. That's always going to be a thing. But even then, like RSS feeds, mm -hmm. it's all just kind of – I'm trying to cram as much information in as little time as possible, mm -hmm. which is getting easier and easier, and that's incredible. So um, we realized right away – or we didn't realize right away, but we, it sort of it, – it just kept getting bigger and bigger that Facebook just would get more and more likes and more comments than the site. And, of course, that's still where we post everything, but I – you know, blogger, I mean, we just did that on a whim because that was what there was at the time. We didn't, I don't know, we didn't know about Tumblr. I don't even know if Tumblr existed then or if it did, we didn't care. WordPress was a little too complicated for us, even though I so badly wish we went to WordPress because that's so interchangeable. That's what we um, use in our class. That's good. WordPress is the way, to me, it seems like the way to go just because it's so open-ended. But um, 
Yeah, that's something that lately I just cannot believe how much Facebook, especially on tour, between that and Twitter, but I think probably more importantly Facebook, you're at work all day, you're in front of your office, you're at school, you're in front of your computer, you just want a constant update. You're not going to go to everythingisterrible.com necessarily. A lot of people do, that's great, but a lot of people just want a feed that's just telling them, hey, we're in Spokane today. Uh, how have you seen video production and, and sort of multimedia storytelling change over the last decade when you've been active? Uh, I think definitely it's de it definitely has changed a lot. I think people's, I mean, I remember being in high school and people talking about the MTV style editing and how fast that was. I don't know if you've looked back at any MTV stuff in the 90s. It's the slowest stuff possible. It's like, it's like cable access compared to what we have now. So definitely attention spans have shortened. My attention span has definitely gotten so, it's like just so short right now. Congratulations I to any students that have made it this far in the video. Yeah, honestly, it's true. So, I mean, really, when it comes, even when it comes to, like, videos that people will send me, two-minute videos I get bored by, and that's a problem. Like, that's a, but I, one of the things that I will actually say that actually is, is a piece of advice I give to editors in general that kind of leads back to that is you should be bored all the time. And it, it really, when it comes to Premiere and it comes to Final Cut, whatever it is, when it comes to editing, let's just say for editing because that's a visual, you're visually, story, you know, storytelling, you have to be bored all the time. That way, it never gets boring because so many times I'll see videos that people show me and you get stuck in a room and you sort of get, you get focused on maybe a shot that you like or a, you, you, get, you hang on to things too much maybe. You get too attached. Do not become attached. You have to, you have to understand that no one is seeing what you, where you're coming from when you're doing a trailer or a 30-second spot or a five-minute video for a TV show, whatever it is. They, don't, they weren't in the room with you laughing at the same, time, at the same joke necessarily of an editing joke. There's plenty of that that we do with everything's terrible. Um, you just, I don't know, you just have to keep, you, you have to keep it very short and sweet and, uh, uh, like I said, just be bored. And uh, that translates a lot with what we do. So especially with everything is terrible where it is so fast paced with the movies, if there's a clip that goes on for more than a few seconds, I start to like freak out. I, I basically, I, I treat it like I'm on speed when I'm watching it. So that way when someone's watching it, or when I'm editing it, so that way when someone's watching it, you're, you're kind of cramming all this information where you kind of want their brain to explode. So, so as somebody who's sort of on the frontier, working, you know, you've got your hands in, in creating film, working in theaters, uh, but also working in TV and online, um, what do you find yourself watching and how has been being a video producer changed your what you can stomach viewing it's actually, and what you enjoy. It's been really interesting actually, because it's been, it's been one of the things that programming has done for me is that it's, it's been a great way just to watch stuff nonstop, just to really be digging and digging and digging. And just like, it's just been crazy. Just that these weird depths you go in and weird tropes in cinema throughout the years and, you know, things that have been lost to time and blah, blah, blah. You try to find it. But then once and just like the classic stuff, like you just you're also just watching the repertory stuff. The 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 I should be watching more of it, but we're very lucky. Uh, not even at the theater, but like we just have things like Hulu now, which has almost the entire Criterion collection on it, which is insane. Like for eight dollars a month, I can watch one of seven hundred classic films from around the world. So um, taking all that in, I'm constantly taking in media. It's nonstop. It's like I'm a junkie for that stuff. But it's pretty much specifically movies and old TV. Uh, so I don't really, but, but not through cable. It sounds like I don't even have cable anymore. I barely actually watch a TV itself. I have a projector in my office here. I've got the whole setup of Western Digital Box. I don't know if you guys all have that. That's my be best advice as far as media equipment. Western Digital is like that TV Live thing. Have you seen that? Yeah, I know. What you're if I, could, about. If I could advertise for them. I would. I would like do <laughs> advertising for them. Um, so I'm just constantly downloading and getting stuff from eBay and iOffer and Amazon and whatever. And uh, it's really helped. One of the ways that's really helped is sort of uh, for filmmaking. Like the, the times that I have made, like the, the music videos that I've done or the original stuff that we've done, it is so easy to make it because of the thousands of hours I've spent watching that stuff where I'm even going through movies that I've either seen a hundred times or that I've never seen before trying to make a trailer for. So you were literally just skimming through it in Final Cut going, that's a good shot. That's a good shot. That's a good. Shot. Okay, okay, okay. What is the and then and then doing that? Going okay. What is this movie about? What is the mood like? Okay, it's kind of dark. Okay, 
I'll use a Joy Division song. That seems appropriate. Okay, so a lot of it's kind of guessing and in a hurry, but also it 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 really helps me when it comes to original content. I'm just saying, this is so easy. It's just I'm breaking it down like that. I'm thinking of it already as a finished product and me running through it a hundred times at a hundred percent or a thousand percent. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Where I'm already just sort of looking at it from the future, kind of like, an, it's almost like an out of body experience where it's like, okay, what is, what is the actual output of this going to be? Is that going to read? I've seen a million things that don't read. <laughs> it sounds like this goes back to the attention span where you're already thinking about the next thing and sort of. Yeah. It's it. really cool because especially when you're directing, it's tough because there's just so many things to pay attention to. But if you're, if you plan ahead, if you storyboard, if you keep those principles the same, I mean, I, I just, I, I, ha I haven't had any trouble bringing something in that I've shot at putting after effects on it, doing, uh, just editing it down, putting music to it. It's just been so simple to me because I think it's just, I think that's also just, uh, you know, kind of just getting used to it after a while. There's sort of that, there's that rule. I can't remember who thought of it, but I talk about it. We've been talking about a lot of the theater of sort of what do these masters have in common? Like, you know, like a Bob Dylan or a John Coltrane or whatever. And it's like, oh, they all studied for at least 10,000 hours. There's this 10,000 hour rule. And I don't know how many hours I've spent at editing or doing what I'm doing, but it, after a while, it just does become just like a reflex where you don't even really think about it anymore. So whether it's for work or for, fun or whatever so um yeah i don't know it's just time is 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 a big part of that of just spending thousands and thousands of hours but it gets easier then it just becomes more like it doesn't become so overwhelming i guess after a while hmm. what yeah. other steps do they need to take to be able to 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 get the foot in the door in the industry i think you just need to really be self-motivated and really uh kind of competitive with yourself like you just need to know that there's a lot of competition out there and a lot of people just don't care because they don't know you. It's not personal. They just don't care about you when it comes to, when it just comes to like a job, I'm just saying, when it comes to just like applying for a job blindly, you kind of have to do something that's really going to stand out and you have to have a body of work that really it's, and more importantly than for getting a job, it's just like what makes you happy really. So if you're here now, like if you're in this class now, if you're not a hundred percent into it, there's no point to me. It's just like, you got to really stick with it and, and, and mo and no one's really going to motivate you more than yourself. And no one's going to, especially after college, no one's going to really care about you. You know what I mean? Like when, when it comes to what I loved, what, one thing that I did love about college is that even if someone was yelling at you or whatever, they were there, they were, they were taking care of you because their, their sort of job was to kind of babysit you, which is awesome. That's why I, I'm not against, school at all really I actually think especially the university setting is great because you're just surrounded by cool people and 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 you know you're in this bubble which is awesome but then you leave that bubble and you're on your own and really the only way I think to kind of survive and just to kind of be happy is just do what you love to do and keep out of, I keep telling myself I'm never good enough and <laughs> just keep working to get better because if you don't it's going to get boring or you know, you're just going to stick, you're going to end up doing the same thing over and over and over again. And I don't, I don't know. That just to me seems like, like torture or like mm. death. So you got to constantly being unhappy, I think is a big part of it. <laughs> it really is. And just forcing yourself to do better. And then stop hanging out. Stop, don't go to bars anymore. That's boring. Just work. Just work on stuff. Be a loser and work. <laughs> that's mm. the only way. That's really the only way. I think that's pretty much everything that I wanted to cover. Uh, so thinking, you know, I sort of described the class to you um, before we started recording. Is there anything else that you would like to add to, say, if you were back there taking this, this introduction media class? Anything uh, that you wish you would have heard when you first started your journey into multimedia communication? Say, I would first of all say that you're very lucky, <laughs> really, because... I mean, I know that things are going to change even in the next, like, five years when these students are my age or whatever, the next however many years. But, like, really, it's amazing. We've got YouTube, which is essentially the Museum of Radio and Television. We've got Hulu, which is the Criterion Collection. We've got Netflix. We've got all this stuff that were available, that are, that, that were, that were, that are at our fingertips that, that we can use as sort of, uh, uh, like, a textbook, really, in a way. So it's really interesting to me to, that whenever you watch something, don't just watch it, like take it in, realize what you like about it and really focus on that. Otherwise 
you know, you're just going to enjoy for what it is and that's fine, but you're, you kind of have to go a step above that. That's why you're here. That's why you're in this class. Probably that's probably what you want to do is take it that step beyond. And that's really involves just saying, I have to be good at everything. <laughs> I have to be, I just, I have to study everything. There are too many, there are just too many people that I know in college that, that when they were in college, they, they, um, they kind of delegated work to other people. And I just think that's really silly. I just think that's, that's great. I mean, essentially, uh, you come to a point where you can only do so much as one person. That's totally understandable. But there are too many people who I think say, I'm just going to do directing. I'm not going to think about composition. I'm not going to think about cinematography. I'm not going to think about color choice or design. I'm just going to be a director. It's like, well, what does that mean? What are you talking about? Mm -hmm. That's only one aspect of it. So even if in the end you only do one, you know, you only become a, a, a cinematographer or you become a camera assistant or whatever it is, you really have to understand where everyone else comes from on a production or just off a production because you'll, you'll, you'll be so much better at your job if you know what everyone else is doing. When a director doesn't understand about editing, it's really hard for them to communicate what they want and to work with people. An editor, a director who came from editing or who came from a lot of different uh, uh, you know, schools of thought is a better director. Mm-hmm because of that, because they understand where other people are coming from. So that's the big thing. That's why kind of contradicting what I said about staying in your room, being a loser. That's only when you're working, when you're with other people, study from them, learn what they're doing, pay very close attention and appreciate what they're doing. Even if it's not something you like mm -hmm. to do personally, really focus on that. And, and, and that will make you, I think a better, whatever you want to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, I think that advice really closely mirrors what I've heard um, from all the professionals I've talked to, and that is, in today's media environment, if you want to be able to get and keep work, you have to be able to do it all. You know that that uh, especially uh, now, like I don't think that was even really true that many years ago. I think that you could make a living. I mean, like you know, we've had friends, like mutual friends, who have been photographers in their entire lives. They were like, "Oh yeah, yeah, yeah you'll make a living doing photography." Now that's not really true anymore, necessarily. Yeah, and they're moving into video, maybe, or to whatever, you know, they're, they're, they're moving around and it's, it's frustrating, but that's the thing. You have to automatically assume that fields are going to crumble around you, that bubbles are going to burst, that there's going to be. And you need to be able to tell the story no matter what, what no matter, the story is going to look like in the end. No matter what. And, yeah. and, and, and it's just going to take time and everything you, sh everything you're doing should be inspiration for that. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think back, I think about it a lot, how I'm constantly, uh, like even just like I'm constantly ordering stuff. I have like a ton of boxes here from Amazon. I'm sitting this this laptop is on a Tractor Pro DJ setup thing. I'm constantly doing stuff that is still in a way inspiration. Like I think if I, I was actually talking to an accountant because I haven't done my taxes in like three years. And I, <laughs> like how much of your how much of your uh, income how much of your uh, spending is based on is is could go could be tax deductible. And I think it's honestly like ninety nine percent of it. Everything other than food is really something that I'm using for work. I'm not going to, I'm not going to claim it all, but you know what I'm saying? It's like, I don't want to, I don't want to go to a movie or watch a show or, or see a concert unless it's some, some, it's going to inspire me in some way. Otherwise I'm just kind of bored and it's not helping me. It's wasting my time. Hmm. Your time is very valuable. Don't waste it by doing something you're not interested in. Just, just focus specifically on what you like. Otherwise, why are you doing it? Excellent. Well, thank you so much again for spending some time with us. 